if you are just joining us on Facebook Live, I'm really excited about tonight. We are um, chatting with, I'm chatting with Lynn Felder, who is a colleague of mine in Winston-Salem, and we're going to talk all about the theater in the triad area and what she's been up to <laughs> since all of this has happened. How are you? How are you doing? <laughs> I'm happy to see you <laughs> online. I, you're based in Winston-Salem and you've covered the arts there for a long time and that includes Greensboro, um, Winston-Salem, High Point area. Prior to COVID, talk to me about the vibrancy of the arts and theater in that area, because I think people living in Raleigh, some people may have no idea how great it is there. Yeah. Well, there was too much to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Greensboro has a symphony, Winston-Salem has a symphony. Winston-Salem has an opera, Greensboro has an opera. And they all have, Triad Stage is in Greensboro and it's the professional theater company there. Winston-Salem has the North Carolina Black Repertory Company, which is a professional theater that produces annual, uh, biannual, biennially. Every two years, they produce the um, National Black Theater Festival here. That's a week of incredible theater, and there's something to do from 10 a.m. until past midnight. Um, and then we have a number of very vibrant little theaters, um, a number of chamber chamber orchestras. And of course, we have the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, which has really world-class theater. It's a pre-professional um, school, in uh, a conservatory school, basically, in the UNC system. So it's um, it, they have they have their own orchestra. They have an opera institute that does two two operas a year. They have uh, wonderful dance programs there and wonderful wonderful theater. An incredible um, campus. When we were there last summer um, for the National Black Theater Festival, that was one of the venues, and it is an incredible campus. That that school. Where was that when I was going to school? <laughs> probably there, actually. It was probably there. Been there since 1965. So a long, a long time. So now, not this past summer, but the summer before, you were covering the National Black Theater Festival there in Winston-Salem. And I was there with some of our fellow critics from the American Theater Critics Association. So for those not familiar with the National Black Theater Festival, can you talk to me about National Black Rep and their presence in Winston-Salem? Because it's such a, such a fantastic organization and they're producing such great work. Yeah, it's, it's an incredibly vibrant organization. And they have, they, they, in recent years, they have done more and more new theater they have established um, a rolling premiere prize that they that they do once a year, and they guarantee a performance in Winston Salem at the probably at the um, National Black Theater Festival, but also in, in two other theaters throughout the Southeast. Um, so it's it's a great prize, and they what's what's coming up. They actually have started having theater indoors um, at the, the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art, which has a nice auditorium. They're socially distancing and masking mm -hmm. and um, having uh, what they call living room theater. So it's, it's um, not completely staged, but partly staged. And they have some new, a new show coming up called Jeffrey Manor by Tanya Pinkins. It's her new play. Um, and that's going to be October 11th. And then another show, Black Americana for Sale, November 8th. Mm. And those will be, you know, limited seating, but it's something. Uh, the other theater that has, I'll get back to um, that North Carolina Black Repertory Company in a minute, but another one of our community theaters, um, Theater Alliance of Winston-Salem, has been doing outdoor shows ever since 
I think the first one was in July. And of course we were on a black top and it was, <laughs> it was almost unbearable, but it was still really fun and really brave of them to do that. And they've done, and they moved to a different outdoor location after that show and have done, um, they've got the, they always do something for Halloween. So they've got the devil boys from beyond coming up um, in just uh, in just a week or so. And so in theater, it, it hasn't stopped, but it's a little bit hobbled. Um, and then another spring theater, which is a youth oriented theater, did an online show and they actually auditioned people all over the country and even had some people from Australia, I think, who auditioned because it was all on Zoom and they coordinated that and did that. That was quite miraculous. And did, it was an original show that the, the theater um, directors wrote. And somebody has done, oh, and um, Little Theater of Winston-Salem just did a seven day uh, in cooperation with Winston-Salem writers. They did a seven day, 10 minute play festival. So every night at 7.30, you could sit down and watch a 10 minute play online. And that was really, that was really fun. So people are, are finding, you know, the pressure is what makes diamonds, right? Pressure is, is not always a bad thing and neither is restriction, I don't think. And, and sometimes I think that people, people get really creative when they have to make do, when they have to be resourceful, they can be really creative. I agree. I don't. Um, one thing that moves me about this period of time is that um, creativity doesn't seem to be able to be quarantined. I keep saying creativity can't be quarantined because there's so much, there's almost too much work going on. You can't possibly see everything because there's so much of it <laughs> right now virtually. Um, also, I do want to mention with National Black Repertory Company, they are going to do the premiere of Nambi Kelly's play about Maya Angelou, which is really exciting. That's supposed to happen next summer, right? During the festival, maybe? It's, um, they're, they're calling it either spring or summer. And so it'll either be during the festival. Let, let me make a distinction here real quick. Um, it's the North Carolina Black Repertory Company. Okay. So that's the company that produces the National Black Theater Festival. National Black, thank you for clarifying. There's, a, there's always a lot of confusion about that, but the company, the, Nash, the North Carolina Black Repertory Company was founded in 1979 by Larry, the late Larry Leon Hamlin, who was just a great, towering, inspiring, flamboyant figure. He was quite wonderful. Um, and he he had friends all over the country and had worked all over the country as an actor, but he was from this area originally. And he, he founded the company in 1979. And then in 1989, the company created the National Black Theater Festival. Mm -hmm. And the, the, first, um, the first honorary chair was Dr. Maya Angelou, who was a professor here at Wake Forest University. And so she corralled all her celebrity friends and, you know, sent out feelers and Oprah came to the first one and, and Sidney Poitier came to one of the early ones and Harry Belafonte. And so all the, the royalty of um, black theater and stage were here in the early days and have continued to come. And they call it. Andre De Shields was there too. Andre Shields, oh my God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Andre De Shields, Leslie Uggam, she won the Lifetime, right? The Lifetime, was it the Lifetime Achievement Award that they gave her two years ago? Yes. And um, Andre De Shields, he was, he came here, he had just won the Tony for Hades Town. And he's been here almost every year. I've seen him here every year, in, including in a show. They did the, um, the great white, the great, oh darn, they did a great Broadway medley mm -hmm. uh, of African-American shows from Broadway. 
and they had the black star, the black stars of the great white way, I think is what they called it. And Andre did his, he was, he originated the Wiz, the role of the Wiz in the Wiz. And so he reprised that role in the Black Stars of the Great White Way. And so I got to see him perform for the first time. And so when he won for Hades Town, I was all primed to, to go see Hades Town. <laughs> I couldn't wait. Plus I knew a song from the show. But anyway, um, he, he took his only day off and came to the National Black Theater Festival. So mm -hmm. he took his one day off from Hades Town. He flew down here at seven, 79 years of age and led a rousing uh, rendition of the Black National Anthem, uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing spontaneously. Nobody knew that was gonna happen. Um, and that's the sort of thing that happens at the National Black Theater Festival as you get to be in a room with Andre De Shields leading Lift Every Voice and Sing. So don't it's, miss another one, you people out there. It's such an amazing um, experience. And I, you know, in Raleigh, we're only, what, two hours away? So I would recommend everybody go. I do want to talk about Nate Jacobs for a second because I saw his show last festival. Um, um, and it wasn't a Motown Christmas. It was, I don't remember what the show was, but I know he has shows at the National Black Theater Festival or has over the last few years. And um, if you're familiar with Motown Christmas that's played here in Raleigh for the last couple of years, that's Nate Jacobs' show. He was here last Christmas to open up Pure Life Theater. And um, and we met him last two years ago at the, at the festival. He was so nice. There was a cast party. So it, great music, great fun great venues you get to really take a tour of winston-salem so yeah you do there's there's uh two or there's several shows every night at some venue and we have three new venues in the milton road center for the arts mm -hmm. uh, that were at that actually the the one two of them opened brand new for the last black theater festival and the third one got got a redo uh, for the for the festival. So, so here in Raleigh, um, there's been concern for so many of our arts organizations because with COVID and with all of these shutdowns, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of concerns that our lot a lot of these theater companies and art galleries and museums wouldn't be able to make it through the pandemic. Um, now there's been a lot of financial assistance and I think people have pivoted and figured out ways to create um, some revenue streams, certainly not what they had. One of the things I love about Winston-Salem is the amazing galleries there. So I do wanna ask you about the galleries um how are they doing through this well they are suffering like everybody else but um we have a, a little arts district um uh, that's uh, mainly the visual arts district where there are lots of galleries and uh Delurk gallery has opened on a limited basis and it's a, a lot of really good new um i would say avant-garde um and outsider art and Piedmont Craftsman, which is uh, definitely kind of a flagship mm. organization, they have not opened up, or they've opened up in a limited way if, if they've opened, but they've had uh, auctions online and online exhibits and galleries. So they've gone that way. Artworks Gallery, which is a cooperative gallery like Delurk, Delurk and Artworks are both um, artist-owned galleries. Um, both of those have opened up to limited to limited traffic, and things things are beginning to you know open up a little bit and cautiously. And I think cautiously is a good idea. Um, <laughs> I'm going yeah. down cautiously. Uh, and I will tell people um, when I first moved to Raleigh, I was a visual artist. I made jewelry and one of the most beautiful art festivals I've ever been to 
is that Piedmont Craftsman Arts Fair, which usually happens in November. It probably will not happen this year, or maybe it'll happen virtually. But again, it, it, under normal circumstances, please definitely um, check it out <laughs> because I love it. And they have the gallery as well when it's open. And I, I, we can't talk about visual arts without talking about the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art, which I will henceforth call SICA. Um, SICA and um, Rinalda House Museum of American Art are both open. They both reopened and um, Rinalda House has a beautiful Tiffany lamp and window exhibit there right now and they're having timed entrance. So mm -hmm. they're again, masking and socially distancing, but you can go and see beautiful, amazing art. Um, the, and, and of course the, the studio, the, the gallery, the Babcock Gallery where the Tiffany lamps are is glowing and the walls are this dark kind of muddy color. And so the lamps really, um, really pop. And they also have a small exhibit in the historic house of, of vases by that were in, in the collection of Catherine Reynolds. And then at Sika, there's a great uh, there's a great art on paper show. It's called Drawn. And draw and it's a very big show for Sika. So it takes it takes place in two of their main galleries. And uh, if you think of drawing, it's not drawing like you think of drawing. It's big stuff. Um, it's the, the show, the genesis of the idea for the show came because they found when, when Roy Neiman died, do you know Roy Neiman or Nyman? Mm -hmm. uh, very splashy uh, sports, very bright colors, very dynamic um, work in lots of magazines like Sports Illustrated and Playboy back in the day. Um, but he was known for his bright, splashy things. But after his death, they found a sketch pad and it was full of just really kind of introverted subjects. Like there were studies of James Baldwin and Muhammad Ali, but all in repose, in, in quiet moments. And so it, the curators became interested in the thing, that, the thing that you see comes from this little idea and that artists have lots of ideas in their sketchbooks that never mm -hmm. see the light of day. And that's how the show happened. But as I said, it's not just like little sketches and sketchbooks. Some of them are, one of them is at least six, 16 foot tall. Uh, so very interesting stuff in the gallery. It's amazing. And um, for those of you who are on the, on the chat, on the Facebook chat, Christy Johnson, Marion, thank you so much. She is sharing all of the Facebook links to Sika and to the Rinalda house. Um, I will say um, I've been to both of these places. The Rinalda house is stunning. Even if you, even if you're not going for the art, just to walk around the house, it's just amazing. <laughs> um, we were there for the Georgia O'Keeffe exhibit. So keep an eye out for Rinalda house. They have amazing exhibits too. Um, and plenty of room to social distance. It's a large, large property. So, um, people what have, is happening in Greensboro? Oh, I'm sorry. People have been using the gardens um, during the lockdown. They have they have great public space, or they allow it to be public space. Um, and so people have been hiking in the gardens and the grounds all throughout the lockdown, which has been really nice. And is the university, is UNC School of the Arts, are they open or are they pivoted to virtual format? Um, all their performances are virtual. I think, I, I honestly, I think there are people there. I think there are students there, but to tell the truth, I don't really know, I can't remember uh, because you know what I'm looking at largely is performance. Um, and they are having, um, they're having a bunch of performances on, online that you can see. So this, is, and this might be a good time to explore um, what they're doing. It they're calling, um, they're they are introducing the Winston Salem Symphony's new assistant conductor Karen Nebron 
is uh, having her debut at UNCSA this Saturday online. Mm -hmm. um, the symphony is doing small in-person sort of house concerts. I went to a concert that at, at an apartment complex where some, or, or a condo uh, complex where some friends of mine live. I went on fr last Friday night and heard a, a wonderful trio from the symphony. Oh, it was fabulous. And um, there, the symphony is doing a fundraiser this weekend. I think it's a fundraiser. Um, called Limon Limoncello uh, <laughs> that's by a duo called Low and Lower and it's a cello and a double bass and I think they do some comedy. <laughs> <laughs> and I know um, Triad Stage is also doing some virtual things as well. Right. Um, what? Give, give me a snapshot of what's happening in Greensboro post-COVID. I'm not, I'm not as hip to Greensboro as you might think I am. <laughs> I'm pretty Winston-Salem, I'm pretty Winston-Salem uh, centric, but I do try to keep an eye on Triad Stage and they have a mystery, um, a virtual murder mystery party coming up online on the October the 29th. Um, and other than that, I think they're just, again, they're kind of cautiously moving back into things, not not too sure what they're up to. Yeah, yeah, I think that's how all the theaters are. They're just cautiously tiptoeing their, getting their toes back in the water. Um, I I know we, we talked about recently, you were with the Winston-Salem Journal and you were covering this vibrant art scene there and um, you were furloughed and... Right, we, we, were, we were furloughed. Um, you know, you, when you're when you're told that you're going to furlough, that the the, um, the the subtext is always so we don't have to lay people off. Um, but I've been, you know, I've been in this business for a long time, and the past 15 years have been rough. Um, so it's not. It was no. It was no shock uh, when they laid off 20. They laid off eight people out of a 28 person newsroom in Winston-Salem. And they all, there were also where the, the same company owns the Greensboro paper mm -hmm. and they were, so they had layoffs as well. Um, and I don't ask me what they're gonna do cause I don't know. <laughs> and, and I don't wanna speculate, um, but probably some kind of combining of, of newsrooms so that, um, because so so again, I will speculate. You know that what happened in the arts, because two of us in the arts section were laid off. We didn't have that many people in the arts section. I have to say, when I came to Winston Salem in 1996 to be the features editor, I had a staff of 13 people, and about five of those were arts editors and reporters. Um, and then when I left, the st the art staff was down to me and um, somebody who also wrote about theater and movies and he left when I left and we have, there was another uh, reporter who was a halftime art reporter, maybe they'll make her full time, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, that's, so, so if there's no art events, there's no art advertising. Um, and I'm sure everybody who's listening knows that newspaper don't, newspapers don't make money on subscriptions, they make money on advertising. Um, one is not related, we, you know, we don't, we don't write for the advertisers, we write, write for the readers, but there has to be that advertising there in order to fund the newspaper. Um, and, you know, so there you go. Um, and again, it, it could, it's just timing. I don't know why these things happen. I just know that, you know, if profits aren't a certain way, staff gets cut. And here we are. And I was partly ready. I, I actually, it's what's funny is I had been actually talking to people probably for the last year um, because saying, you know, I got to figure out something to do <laughs> because either they're going to get tired of me at some point or I'm going to get tired of them. I mean, that's just, you know, nothing lasts forever. And I had a, I had a wonderful time there. Um, people uh, don't do journalism for the money, but you know, 
I, I think there's something to be said for figuring out what you love to do and figuring out how to make your living doing it because you're going to be doing it, you know, eight hours a day at least. And um, I was really, really, really happy um, in journalism. And I, I love the work. And, but so far for me, the work is continuing because I had set up a blog a couple of, uh, 18 months ago, actually. I had started a blog for a particular project and, and another furlough. Um, and so, it was when this happened, I just said, okay, I'm going to take a three pronged approach to this. The first prong is the blog, which is I'm treating like a three times a week art newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I have, you know, I, I don't know, it's going to be a, a combination of stuff, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's focusing on whatever's happening, really, just like I did when I was at the paper. And so that's the blog is one prong. The second prong is I'm letting people know that I am available to, as an arts publicist for organizations or for, um, for artists themselves. And some of this work I have done in the past couple of weeks pro bono. And in other cases, I'm actually working for actual money for artists who, are, um, who understand the need uh, to, for somebody to help them strategize their approach to getting their work out there in front of people. Um, and you know, it's really fun. So I get to continue to work with artists, which is what my great love is anyway, art and artists, people who I get to talk every day with people who love what they do. Mm -hmm. And it makes me love what I do. <laughs> and the other prong is to, is a freelance writer. And I'm, so I'm, I'm approaching, approaching that. Um, and something will, you know, in the meantime, I'm doing what I love to do. And the wolf's, the wolf's not quite at the door yet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are so many artists that I've spoken to throughout the pandemic. And, and all of them rely on this gig economy, which is no longer there uh, for them, for a lot of them. Um, what kind of advice would you have to those artists and arts organizations now to keep themselves relevant? Because truly, this isn't going away anytime soon. What we thought was going to just last a few months is going to last into next year. So what, what can artists do um, and arts organizations do to keep themselves out there? in a positive way. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, they have to do something. They have to do something. Um, they can't hide and wait for it to blow over. And I don't think many people want to do that anyway, because there's this, it's the, a certain amount of this stillness lets us really get in touch with, uh, which brings us to the, which brings us to the next topic of mindfulness. Um, a certain, a certain amount of, imposed um, imposed stillness gives us space to be more creative than ever mm. and to, to, to move away from the clutter and the clatter and just come into ourselves and figure out what's really important because at things have opened up a lot for me. I'm moving around a lot more, but the, you know, definitely the first six months, I didn't go out a lot. I didn't go to the grocery store every time I felt like I needed a head of cabbage, you know. <laughs> I waited and I timed those things and I went in the early morning when it wasn't busy. Um, and, and just not jumping up, um, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but somebody said that all the troubles of mankind are caused because we can't sit by ourselves in a quiet room, <laughs> you know, and, and there is so much benefit to sitting by yourself in a quiet room. And you, I think you, you said, um, Lauren, that you've done a little bit of work in mindfulness and, and yoga and besides, so my other love, besides my husband and my cats, <laughs> and my nieces and my nephews, um, my, my other love is yoga. 
and mindfulness practices. And I think that besides doing something and getting yourself out there and you know, keeping yourself in front of as much media as you possibly can, if you can't get people in person. Besides that, I think this is just a glorious time to sit and be by ourselves in a quiet room and find out what's bubbling up, you know, with, with all the clatter, so much TV, so much, even, even books on tape. I mean, I am hooked on all those things. I love TV. I love the movies. I love theater. I love dance. I love music. But, but just, just pausing for a minute and collecting ourselves. And I'm, I am actually seeing arts organizations do this kind of thing in, in, you know, with their teams. Mm -hmm. And artists, you know, artists to some degree do it anyway. I mean, you, when you talk to artists, you'll hear that, you know, they're in the zone when they're painting or when they're, you know, the dancers just doing the bar work. I mean, you're just there, you're totally into it. You're feeling every muscle, every sinew. You're, you're present um, when you're doing your acting work. You have to be present for your acting partner. So there's a lot of presence, a lot of um, inward looking things that we can do in this time of limited activity to prepare us for times when activity will once again be limited, uh, unlimited, illimitable. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like um, this period of time and this period of stillness helps artists and helps, well, I'll, I'll stick to the artists for a second, appreciate the process so much more because I think as artists, we get kind of hung up on the end product and getting it done and getting it finished and meeting all these deadlines. And for me, what I'm seeing with a lot of arts organizations now is that they are experimenting more Mm -hmm. and not so much concentrating on the finished product, but concentrating on the process. And I think that's kind of exciting to see. That's something we don't usually get to see. Right, so we're not, we're not rushing to get the thing produced because we can't. So we, we are in, we're in the process, as you say, more and valuing that process for what it teaches us about being a human being, which is what mm -hmm. all about. I, I agree, I agree. And I do wanna talk a little bit about yoga and movement and mindfulness and how that can help us navigate um, tough times. You know, I used to think of yoga as something that was for a certain type of person, a certain type of person who has a certain type of physique. I don't have the physique that I used to think of yoga <laughs> yogis as, but I'm realizing yoga is really for anybody. <laughs> That's what I'm learning to embrace. <laughs> to say that you're too stiff, to, you're not flexible enough to do yoga, it's like saying you're not dirty enough to take a bath. Or too dirty to take a bath or something. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I know what you mean. Exactly. I, I think it's really um, just being present. It's teaching me how to be present at a time when there's a whole lot of distractions in my house. <laughs> and how to be in your body and on the earth. Because mm -hmm. what happens in these times when there's so much, so there's not the kind of activity that we're accustomed to, but there is disturbing activity uh, because people are afraid of the virus. People are afraid around uh, political divisiveness. People are afraid around new things that are happening and coming up and new ideas. And so there's so much going on really mentally um, that it's important to, um, to to get our brains in our bodies and 
and get settled. Um, I think I told you that after um, my husband had planned a, a trip um, before I was laid off and he said, well, come on, you know, you can go, you can go with me now. And I said, I don't want to go anywhere because a, a layoff is a, um, you know, it's, it's a schism in your life. It's like, it's a break. And when you have a break, then anxiety comes up and fear comes up and just a, a disorientation um, comes up. And so I said, no, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to stay with the cats and be settled and be, you know, just, just easy in my home um, and not get on an airplane, <laughs> go up in the air, you know, everything is up in the air. I don't want to be there. I want to be down here on the ground, um, getting my feet under me, under me and figuring out what's next. As theater organizations have shuttered, I'm wondering, and I've wondered this for myself, and I know we have a lot of colleagues kind of wondering the same thing, what does this mean for arts journalism? It's very hard to go to a Zoom play and critique it as we would critique a live performance. So what, what is the future of arts journalism and, and arts criticism, do you think, having done this for a long time? Well, I think that we can just let up on criticism for a little while. I don't think that people need to be held to the same standard that they would be held to during, <laughs> let's say, peacetime. Let's call it peacetime. Um, I, you know, I think that that for me, you know, I'm just going to be as open-hearted and as um, accepting and interested and curious. Um, that's you know that that to me comes before criticism anyway. Is, is what's going to happen, um, what's happening. Um, at some point, you know, we may be able to impose, and, and I don't think, you know, theater's not going to go away. It, it's going to all be back. Um, and I'm a, I'm a ridiculous optimist. So <laughs> if I'm wrong, so be it, you know, I'd, I'd rather have the, um, the peace and the comfort of uh, believing that it's going to come back. Uh, and that it's gonna be better than ever and more interesting because I think that people will have insights during this time that they'll wanna bring forward. I, I went to actually, um, I went to the Women's Theater Festival that's in, in Raleigh or Durham or Wake Forest. Wow. Wake Forest. Um, I went to that online and participated in um, the, I juried it. Mm -hmm. So I watched, 24 plays and some of them were a couple of hours over a two-week period and then and then when the when it opened it was a, a weekend period that people mm -hmm. watched all these plays it was kind of amazing and it was fun to see how these theater companies either the theater company or the director or the author or the actors adapted to a Zoom format because all of the plays were on Zoom and it was crazy. And some of them were just talking heads and that, unless it was really, really riveting material, that got old pretty fast. And some of them used the medium, you know, that to make um, plays that were more, that were, were less linear and more, uh, kind of abstract and and using sound and light and movement on the screen. And and to put a plug for our Women's Theater Festival, they, they're continuing to make work um, virtually and they have in November an Occupy the Stage 48 hour play reading festival online. So I would encourage um, anybody to go to Women's Theater Festival. I, I will, um, you can look them up on Facebook, on social media. I think it's Women's Theater Festival and see, um, I will share the link and, and get that word out as too. Um, along with all these fabulous Winston-Salem um, Piedmont resources you've given us so that 
people can find all these things that we're talking about. <laughs> Do you think the virtual experiences help or hurt or 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 neither um help or hurt the the arts organizations and the theaters long term do you think audiences will return once the doors open or do you think that we're getting getting spoiled by all these virtual experiences um i don't i don't i haven't seen anything that's good enough to spoil me mm -hmm. And I sit in front of a computer all day, um, writing and researching and and talking to people and doing what I do. Um, and so I, I I am ready to to walk away from it in the evening and walk into, you know, flesh and blood people. I have always said that movies are bigger than life and TV is smaller than life, but live theater is life. Mm. And we have such a communal connection. There's a thing that um, Brene Brown, I don't know if you know Brene Brown, she talks about um, it's a collective effervescence that you experience in the physical company of other people sharing, sharing an experience. It could be a sports event or it could be Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Um, but it's a it's an experience that we have together when we're together physically that I don't think can be replicated in the digital world. I'm grateful for the digital world. I'm glad we have it. I think it will inform what we do going forward. And I do not think it will hurt it in any way whatsoever, because nothing does. You know, it just adds to our experience. It adds to our understanding and it makes us hungry for live theater. I know it does me. I <laughs> do. Do you think it makes theater and art more accessible to people? Um, I know the people at Women's Theater Festival. We've had many conversations about the accessibility piece of this. Um, what do you think? Well, I think if it does, that's a great thing. Um, I know that there are things that I do go to online that I would not go to in person because it's because it is even though even though even though I say I would but uh, because it is easier to sit down all you know after taking a break to come back to the computer at the end of the day and then you know go to it online or or, or meetings that I would um, meetings that I'm invited to that I wouldn't necessarily take the time away from my work to go out to a meeting and then come back and I will do it, but I will do it online. Mm -hmm. So, and, and if people, you know, if, if people are, are intimidated or I, I don't, you know, I, I, this has been such a milieu for me for so many years that it's hard for me to imagine that people would be intimidated to go to the live theater. But um, if, if, they, if they haven't had the experience and they have the experience, it, you know, digitally and then say, oh, well, the, you know, this, this the theater stuff is kind of cool. Maybe I'll go see some in person when we get out of here. Do you think audiences will come back? You said you went to um, a live concert recently. Do you think audiences that, uh, will? I, I've been to theater and music outside. Outside, not inside. Do you, yet. do you think people will are are as you gauge audiences at those kinds of events? Are people nervous about going to these kinds of things? Or are they ready to just get out? <laughs> well, um, the the events that I've been to, people have been masked mm -hmm. and they social distanced. You know, and so I think in that kind of situation that people feel safe and comfortable. I, I'm, I'm very interested to see, we have um, Cape Fear Regional Theater in Fayetteville is opening Lady Day this weekend and I will be there for that. That's an outdoor performance and I'll be curious to see how it, how it is, mm -hmm. uh, social, mm -hmm. social distance outside masked theater. <laughs> we'll see. Um, 
what um what are you working on now i know you went to the tiffany exhibit i will put the link to your website so people can read about that and see some of the glorious pictures that you've posted from that um what are you what's upcoming that you're looking forward to that we can we'll be reading about on the blog wow tomorrow i tomorrow i'm posting um a preview of the winston Sa of winston salem fashion week which mm -hmm. it's the sixth year for Winston-Salem Fashion Week. And it's the first year that they've had to do it online and they've done it online. And I think they've done um, a bang up job. I think fashion is, you know, it's like poppy and popular and um, just fun. And I think that what they're going to have online will be very um, entertaining. Um, that they, they, we've got, um, Anyway, I have my blog tomorrow that posts at 10 o'clock is about that, um, how you can go, um, who's, who's in it. They, because, again, because it's online, they were able to get some people to participate who are in Los Angeles. So mm -hmm. both very local, um, fiercely local, but also, you know, opened up to people all over the country because of the digital world. And um, I, that, you know, that's something that I've seen that's, that's been encouraging is that there's a little more cross-pollination, a little more, um, you know, it's not, it's here, but it's not just here. And so people can see us and we can see them. It's amazing, right? It's amazing how it, I, to me, although we're all kind of socially distanced and we've been in quarantine, it's amazing how much smaller the world seems to me because we're all able to connect virtually. It, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. I'm going to share, um, <laughs> if it's successful, I will share my screen and, um, and just take people to your website for a second. Um, this is the artzenstuff.com website, which is Lynn's blog. I'll put a link, but there's some great stuff, um, great photographs, great articles um, that people can scroll through. So I'm very excited about this, um, this new venture. Including, I'm looking for Including a blog about me and Lady Gaga. Yes, look. Up here, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll go. To, I'll be able to go to that article. Um, here is Lynn. This is you. Um, <laughs> ballroom dancing <laughs> to I. Uh, you're doing a Viennese waltz to Iris by the Goo Goo Dolls, and this article, which is actually very cool, I had not thought about it before, is about Lady Gaga's music and how. Her music is great for dancing too. I'm not dancing like we would think, not club dancing, but poker face is a great cha-cha. That's how you open this article. <laughs> Are, do you still dance? Um, every chance I get, but I'm not ballroom dancing. Um, although <laughs> us, uh, there's a lovely studio here um, that is open and is teaching um, at social distance, you know, line dancing and whatever they can. Well, people can follow you online. People can see um, on social media and certainly people can see the website and, and you're posting three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. Yep. Excellent. Thank you so much for doing this with me. I'm so glad we got to hang great. out for great. a bit. Great to talk to you, my friend. We great. see each other usually once a year at the <laughs> uh, American Theater Critics Association. I know. Well, I hope to be there next summer for the National Black Theater Festival. Yeah. I had such a good time last time I was there and it hopefully is. we'll get back to New York at some point. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a party all the time at the um, theater festival, I'm telling you. Yeah. Let me well, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you all for tuning in. Tomorrow, um, Thursday, rather, Juan Isler will be back with a fantastic panel discussion. Um, for those of you who are new to, to RDU on stage on Thursday nights, 
we host a discussion on theater and racism. And um, a group of artists here in Raleigh formed a group called Theater on Racist Negativity or TORN. And um, this Thursday, they have an incredible panel lined up. So um, come back and join us for that. And Lynn, I hope to see you soon. <laughs> see you soon. Hope to see you all in the theater or yeah. outside of the theater soon. <laughs> yes, stay safe and healthy. And um, I will, I'll keep up with the blog. I'll see you online. <laughs> My great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll see you Thursday. <laughs>